Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 201 of the NC DWI Guy podcast. On today's episode, I have my friend Ryan Stowe to talk to us about being a courtroom warrior, about how he has grown his practice using social media, the culture that he is trying to establish at his firm. And this is a part of our Warriors series that we are doing, highlighting some of the young leaders in criminal defense in North Carolina. Had a blast of a conversation with Ryan and hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Ryan, it is awesome to have you on the show. I am so pumped for the conversation. It seems like we've gotten to honestly like have you know some, some good text exchanges we got to talk like briefly at the freedom fighter summit in october but i don't feel like we've had like a really good like long deep conversation to date so like i'm i'm actually really pumped about the conversation cuz everything that i see you doing on social media and uh you know your website like it, you 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 clearly have like a great vision of what a criminal defense firm should look like and what your culture should look like, how your client should uh, feel and what you're trying to bring to the table on that front. So it's fun being like a follower and now getting to have like a little bit more of an in-depth conversation. So I'm pumped about it. I'm pumped as well. Um, so it's it's interesting because for me, it's like I'm sitting down meeting one of my heroes. <laughs> <laughs> I followed you from the beginning as well. Um, so uh, I mean, I've always enjoyed the podcast. So for me, I'm I'm fangirling. <laughs> That's awesome. No, I I uh, well, it's mutual, man. I I'm I'm uh, really excited about it. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things to uh, kind of talk about in terms of your firm identity and culture and some of the ways that again you've used uh, social media uh, to really kind of bring your personality, I would say, to uh, to the public. But before we get into any of that, we are kind of going through this, you know, kind of um, new leaders uh, podcast series. And that's that's kind of this is part of that series. And so just from like a kind of background perspective, what was it that made you really want to go into criminal defense in the law school? Tell us a little bit about the the story of, of Ryan Stell. Perfect. So law school is very intentional. I wanted to go into politics. So I figured I needed to be a lawyer, which I went to law school. Then I interned on Capitol Hill with Congressman John Conyers. And once I got to Capitol Hill, I realized I did not want to go into politics. <laughs> However, I was a second year law student. So I knew at that point I needed to be a lawyer. What was the what was the turnoff in terms of politics? What, what like was there anything specific or was it just like a general this isn't my thing? What the turning point was when I was sitting there and I was watching congressmen and women vote on something and a guy says, no, he, he's the only person voting no. And he instantly changes his mind because he was the only one. And he said, wow. never mind. Yeah. Yeah, that shit. is talk about talk about bad peer pressure right there. <laughs> that and then um, with a lot of my um, friends who were staffers we did so much babysitting of yeah. their congressman that they worked for that it just, I could never do that. And so yeah. that just a big turnoff for me, but yeah, no, that's, offense, that's that was totally an accident. Um, and so what happened was I had a good friend I went to undergrad with, she got a speeding ticket and she asked me, I had just passed the bar. She said, can you represent me? And I said, no. And she says, no, 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 you're the only one, you're the only <laughs> lawyer I trust and you need to do it. And I said, look, I don't even trust me. I have no <laughs> idea what you. And she's like, look, here's $150. Figure it out. Like, she just gave, sent me money without doing anything. So I asked somebody what to do. They told me, and I did it very, very easy for me. So at that point, I said, okay, I'm just only going to do speeding tickets. I'm a lawyer who does nothing but speeding tickets. That's awesome. Um, a couple months later, this same friend got a marijuana, a simple possession of marijuana charge. 
And I kid you not, the exact same thing happened. She's like, hey, I'm going to give you $500. Go represent me on this. You'll figure it out. I trust you with my life. And I did it. And then I said, okay, well, I will be a criminal defense lawyer. And that's all I'll do because that's all I know how to do. And it worked out well for me. And so that's how it came to pass. Man, that's I had no awesome. idea I was ever going to do criminal defense. But thanks to one friend who got caught with marijuana and sped one time, I'm now a criminal defense lawyer. <laughs> so so that that friend is like a silent equity partner i would assume now at the at the first <laughs> yeah for sure it's funny but she always lets me tell the story she's like you can tell my name you can tell everybody about what happened <laughs> that's so. awesome no that's that's a i mean it is funny because i feel like there is you know there's there's some people that go in really with like this is their passion project from the day that they entered law school sometimes even earlier than that and for me it was definitely like that's kind of just what I fell into as as like the area of law that was most kind of interesting and engaging really to me, like in law school. And then even afterwards, I went to to work with a uh basically the only person that would hire me at the time, like my 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 uh, brothers, my younger brothers by 10 years, uh Jeremy, his basketball coach at the time was looking for an associate. So it was just like Jake will work. You know? <laughs> I said that this is this is the the person that fits the bill. And yeah, so but but he kind of let me do some traffic stuff. And it was like that. Oh, this is this is where the the juice is at. So um, yeah, that's cool. That's a cool story. It, you know, what was the uh process then of kind of like building from that, you know, first case, you know, and and you thinking like, hey, this is this is, you know. I like I like this. I like talking with people or or negotiating, whatever it might be. You know what what was like kind of the initial build out there in the first couple of years? So at first it was just trying to keep overhead low and just thinking yeah. through how to build a sustainable practice. And then it became how do you build a practice that is different and modern from everyone else? And and, and so we started doing a lot more. We started marketing a lot differently. Um, at that time, we were doing a lot of memes and things of that nature, um, just so that, you know, what I learned was that people don't want to share an advertisement on Facebook. Yeah. What people share on Facebook has to either be funny or informative. And so I would be making a lot of memes like it, it may say something like. um your, your if your boyfriend wants to take you out on a date but his license is revoked you should give me a call or something i don't that's yeah. not funny but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Thing yeah, yeah. Not funny but this would be means about that and people would share and it would go viral and so we'd have people calling us all the time now because they saw a meme and so like we just advertised strictly on memes at one point um but then i quit doing that because i wanted to be more of a mature lawyer but um that was okay, kind of how we started growing yeah that's awesome to hear see i i i, I probably missed that piece of of your marketing because I do I mean I see a ton of stuff from you on social media and it really is different like I get all kind I mean I'm sure that most of the people listening to this podcast get all kinds of lawyer ads and things in their Facebook um, feed just because you're clicking on other lawyers or you're friends with other lawyers and so their ads and and law firm ads are running and I ignore. I, like my my mind, I can't even like see it because I'm so used to just like you know pushing that out. But your stuff is always like, man, I'm gonna read what Ryan puts up. And so whatever it is that you're doing in terms of being different on social media, it really is uh, focused in zeroed in on attention. And a lot of these like other advertisements are, some of them are t terrible. You know, just basically like the billboard equivalent of a you know, of a social media post. Others are, you know, good in the sense that they are well put together, you know, maybe even have like some video, but still boring. It's like, unless you're like really are, you know, charged with something and like, oh my gosh, like I need this person right this second, which is not necessarily how social media works for the most part. Like, I mean, that's not really where people are going to, to find somebody when they need an attorney like this, Second, it's it's really about like that attention grabbing quality. And with yeah, with your stuff that you put out there, um, whether it's words or or pictures, like there's definitely something that is much more 
authentic about uh, what you're putting on social media. So yeah, I mean, e even in terms of like describing that maturity from memes to what you're doing now, you're still being very authentic and different on social media. So I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that front. Yeah. So, you know, ultimately it boils down to, I'm just having fun. Yeah. And that's you can tell. like everything you can I tell did when you read what you put fun. out there. Yeah. Um, that's all. I just want to have fun. We're, we're right now we're doing a lot of short form, short form video content on TikTok, thing of that nature, but it's solely just to have fun right now. And it's, it's, it's working from both a ROI standpoint, but I am actually really having fun. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that that is so critical. And again, it, it, it almost makes it easier. Not again, not even from like a selling standpoint, because again, when you're doing it from that point of like, this is just a blast putting this information out there, then it's, then it is different because it's kind of like, it doesn't matter if this lands or not, but it's more likely to land because of the fact that it's not coming from like a position of selling or this position of like, you know, I need you to do something for me. I need you to click, you know, it's, there's, there's no real ask other than like, Hey, let's, let's connect, you know, like, let's have a, have a good, a good, uh, share here. And so I, I mean, yeah, that, that totally comes across in, in everything that you're putting out there. It's fun to read. It's, yeah. Sometimes other lawyers will ask me if it works or why I did it. And it's like, you know, I was just having fun and I don't care. It's yeah. kind of like in the movie air at the end where Phil, Phil and I just like, what did we just do? We just do, we just ruined a company. And it was like, well, at least we had fun doing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's, how I feel about it. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I, that's a great movie too. I, I just watched that a couple of months back and that's uh I loved it, man. That was a great, great movie. But that's absolutely, I think the, I think that's the attitude that you have to have with your business to some extent. And it's, it's again, it's not to like basically not be careful. It's not about like just, you know, taking unnecessary risks or, you know, having this thought process of like, you know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Like, it's not that mindset. It's just, you know, being willing to kind of put yourself out there in a, in a way that is again, authentic, genuine, vulnerable, like that to me is what sells. Um, if you want to talk about like clicks and likes on social media, because from the most business marketing, it is just about like, we want you to buy, we want you to call us. And so when you're not putting it out there in that way. It's just very differentiating. For sure. Well, in terms of uh, one of the things that you had shared um, uh, with me a couple of months back that I just love, and this is like still, still uh, like something I think about, honestly, like on a weekly basis, you talked about your kind of like trial prep room as your war room. And that has really just like stuck with me because I think it is um, so easy to kind of like compare trial to battle and, you know, uh, going through, going through whether it's district court or superior with a jury, like going through that process as this, this war. And so I, I kind of wanted to just dig a little bit deeper into that kind of like warrior mindset that you have. You were, uh, you told me earlier in the week that you were scheduled for uh, for a trial. And I know you take a lot of, a lot of cases to trial. So talk a little bit about just kind of that warrior mentality. Cause I, I, um, you know, going from traffic ticket, you know, this is where I'm going to be, you know, to, to trying a lot of cases is a very different, different space. So what was that transition like? Well, you know, <sighs> When you think about lawyering and helping people, sometimes the greatest way to help somebody is to say no to the man. It's just yeah. we're going to fight against this, and and that's all it came down to, really. Um, and of course, there were some times where it was just maybe egotistical, where it's the DA saying you get no plea offer, and it's like, well, yeah. I'm not going to plead guilty to it. Um, there's no way because the result would be the same if we lose, so yeah. we may as well, you know, buckle up, Buttercup. Here it's time for trial. <laughs> What happens, um, and so um, I enjoy it. Um, I really do. Is it, um, it, what what percentage of your uh, practice is like in district court versus superior? What does that kind of breakdown look like? I'd say about eighty percent is district court, twenty percent is superior. 
Okay. Um, generally, our superior court cases are usually the lower level felonies or misdemeanor appeals. We have some higher level felonies, but I, I try to stick in district court land just because it's, I can have a lot more fun down there um, than in superior court because it's just so much, it's so more formal, so much serious. Uh, so superior court just really isn't that fun for me. I'm, I'm good at it, but um, and I know I've probably said the word fun a million times, but I'm just at a phase of life where I just want to have fun and I don't want to yeah. do things. I, I don't feel a need to do things that I don't want to do. That's a amazing space to be at. You know, we were, um, you know, we were talking with, with uh, our team about some, you know, possible, possible topics for, um, uh, you know, our weekly huddles and, you know, uh, one of the, one of the suggestions that came up was, you know, kind of like, you know, how do you deal with, um, you know, burnout? Like, could we have somebody come in from like a mental health standpoint and kind of talk about burnout? And I mean, that's a, a great, uh, thing to talk about and, and, you know, what to do when you get into that space. But I think one of the easiest ways, um, to, uh, kind of deal with, burnout is before it happens, you know? And, and so when you're having a blast doing what you do, it's, it's obviously pretty easy, not, you know, there's bad days in the midst of all that, but it's, it's pretty easy to avoid like a kind of long stretched out period of burnout. And so I think it really does kind of boil down to, you know, finding your passion. What, it, what is it that you are good at what are you you know motivated to do and driven by and i love the description of district court as fun because you walk into a district court courtroom you know in in Asheville you know all your friends are there you know like i mean there's you know th these other great lawyers in the defense bar that that are there um you know you 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 get you get to talk to you know the same people on the state side of things we've got DAs in the uh, uh, Buncombe County. We've got good DAs here. There are, you know, every once in a while you're in a space where there's like a, a DA that's a little bit rough to work with, but for the most part, you know, good people to work with on the other side. Um, and, and I mean, just, just being able to stand beside your client and really go to bat for them is just such a privilege. You know, I think it's a privilege that is easy to take for granted when you do it day in and day out all the time, seeing the same thing over and over again, but it's a real treat, I think. And, and so, it is. Yeah, yeah. And with, with district court, the, the, for me, the best thing about it is there's nothing I can do there that I can't fix later. So I lose a child. I can appeal it. I get someone the wrong reduction. I can MAR and I can, there's nothing that you can't do that will permanently mess yes. anyone up. And, then, and that's one thing that just makes it so much less pressure. In district court. <laughs> that's so true. Yeah, now, obviously true. we don't want to mess up anything, but in the event that the mistakes happen, they're all fixable. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that does allow a lot more freedom, even when it comes to like trying a case, you know, I mean, if, if there's nothing to lose, you know, I kind of try to constantly preach on the podcast uh, to, to lawyers that are handling DWI cases or any criminal matters. If you're not, if you don't have anything to lose by taking it to trial, take it to trial. You get the experience of it. You you kind of get to see how the prosecutor prosecutes a case. You get to, um, you know, just sharpen your sharpen your skills. Like I mean, there's just so many benefits to taking cases to trial, and so many lessons to be to be learned. And I think the number one thing that keeps attorneys from taking cases to trial is just fear of looking silly in front sure. of other people, which again, I understand that, but at the end of the day, it's like, we all look silly at some point in front of other people sure. anyway. So. Yeah. You know, the good thing about superior court is that you, no one will be at the person's trial, but your client, like they <laughs> never have a mom, they never have a wife. And I mean, you're literally the only one there. There's never an audience in superior court. And yeah, as long as my client doesn't think I'm silly, whether that's in district court or wherever, then I'm okay about it. <laughs> that's, that's a great perspective. That's awesome. Well, in terms of like kind of growth of your firm, what has been like, you know, from, from that first traffic ticket for your friend to now, what have been some of the biggest strategies for growing your firm over the years? Um, so focusing on Google, um, we have a ton of Google reviews. We always want to make sure people leave them, leave us Google reviews, focusing on SEO, like real SEO, not just paying scammy companies and doing scammy link backlinks to your website, but actually focusing on 
quality content for our website and the user experience on the website. Um, those have been the very, very, the biggest things for the growth of our firm. And then yeah, the, the other th- along the review front, you know, I was actually, um, I was kind of searching randomly for our office because I needed the address in one of our office locations. And it, it was in, I think it was in Durham. I think I was looking for the Durham office, um, but I was doing it from my Surface Pro, which uses Microsoft. I think it's Bing that it's, you know, the search engine that's running it. And your firm came up, you know, like from, from a different part of the state. And I, I think part of it was because Facebook um, has like a review, uh, a review portion as well. And you got a, you know, pretty wild amount of Facebook reviews. Like, I mean, you know, a, a lot more than I think most firms have. And I think that's, that was something that was like, you know, interesting. Cause it was like, man, that's, that's, uh, that's cool. That Brian is really kind of, again, focusing on the social media side of things, because I think there's a lot of lawyers now that are focusing on Google and we focused on Google as a firm, but Facebook is somewhat like untapped in terms of the impact that it has on search engines that are kind of like, we're not recognizing Google reviews because we don't want to support Google basically. So that, that was, I mean, yeah, kudos to you on that front. Cause that was a, a cool thing. Along those same lines is Yelp actually like reviews on Yelp actually will really push your um, your uh, site, especially on Apple Maps a lot. I have not figured out how to get people to leave me a Yelp review. No one ever does. <laughs> it's definitely if hard. You crack that code, <laughs> you will be uh, doing very well. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is Yelp that... kind of controls Apple Maps. Yeah, it's a good it's a good thing to know. I think you know, there's just uh, I think that again, most people out there, most uh, criminal defense lawyers out there know. Uh, you know, Google reviews, but again, Facebook and Yelp, but that's definitely like a, a good place. And I, I, I'll maybe echo you on the Yelp side of things because Apple's going to be where it's at, especially as more and more people are kind of like talking to their phone, um, you know, find me a criminal defense lawyer in this space. Um, that's going to become more and more important to have that kind of high ranking on those map apps. But and this is going to sound counterintuitive, but one of the better ways that we've grown our firm is being very hyper selective with clients and like turning down clients has helped grow our firm a lot. And so one, we have a, we have a saying at our firm is that clients don't choose us. We choose our clients. And so we choose who we want to work with. We don't work with everyone who comes in the door and Ron Shook is going to kill me. And I hope he doesn't get (laughs) to it. But we can't get to charging consults yet. Just, we, we almost tried at one point, at one point, but because we want our consultation to figure out if we even want to work with this person. Yeah. Yeah. And if not only are we a good fit for them, but are they a good fit for us? And so that is one thing I think has helped grow our firm because people, we've tried to brand ourselves that we don't want people reaching out to us if they're not serious about their cases. Yeah. And then we've got so many kind of rules about what types of cases we won't take because we only do criminal defense. And so being able to focus on that one area and the riches are in the niches, I think that's really helped our brand uh, just by being able to say, look, we do one thing and one thing only, and we do that one thing very, very well. Um, We're not a general practice firm. Don't come to us if you want a divorce and a traffic ticket, or don't come to us if um, you've got a personal injury need and you slapped your neighbor. We only do one thing. And so that has helped us a lot in terms of branding. Yeah, I think that that selectivity not only, you know, is a, sounds like a boost on the business front, but again, in terms of avoiding burnout is so critical to work with people that you feel connected with that. Again, you kind of feel like that attorney client relationship is working both ways. And I I think that that is one of the, I don't even think this is like a young lawyer problem. I think this is like just across the criminal defense spectrum. It's so hard to turn down potential money, but we all know during those consults, which clients it's going to be like, there's no way I'm going to make what I should on this case. Like there, there's just, you know, it, there's, it's not going to happen. And so, you know, I, I think that that is just being able to be very intentional about that and, and having that be part of your firm culture is so healthy, not only for all of the team members there at the firm, but for the clients that you also take on. Because now, instead of putting your attention on this one client that is, you know, 
overly demanding and calling all the time and you know using up precious hours of your team's time you're able to spend that on on clients that you know you really feel feel better suited to help and you know that that ha- that you know kind of mutual relationship is existing with so i think that's so powerful to have that and i think you know even though we all know that in the back of our mind for whatever reason it's just like the it's built into us to be like oh, we can't say no if it's like the type of case that we that we want it's like you can you can do that <laughs> we do it i mean delayed gratification is the best thing once you learn. <laughs> But we do it religiously. Well, in terms of uh, kind of like the the uh, culture of the firm that you're kind of building, what, if anything, has kind of shifted or changed over the years as you've brought on other people uh, to work with you, other team members? What is what is kind of, you know, that obviously is part of the culture, like we're going to we're going to be selective about kind of our client process, but what, what, what is part of the, uh, or what, what's kind of an overview of the culture that you're creating? So we want to make sure that everyone here feels valued and respected. We also want everyone here to compete with themselves every single day to at least be 1% better. And we read a ton of books here together. That's um, awesome. And some of which I've seen that are on your book club we've read. And uh, but that's what we do. We just try to, grow every day and then we also have a culture here that anyone can can constructively criticize someone else and so someone can walk in my office today and say you did a b and c wrong or you could do this better and here's how and that might be different at other firms but my door has never been closed it's always an open door anyone can come in here and tell me all the various ways that i'm messing up and (laughs) they have a solution we'll figure it out (laughs) And that's one thing that I think um, has really set us apart is that we focus on how we can be better, how we can improve um, our firm, how we can improve our client relations with people and get better results. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, that you should be. I think, I think that um, real meaningful feedback is so hard to get and so valuable in terms of little tweaks to the, to the business are the ones that kind of make the most difference. And so it's, it's those like small, small changes that really have the most power over the long haul. I'm just kind of curious because, you know, I, I think that, uh, right now in our, in our, uh, office, our quarter one, um, core value that we're focusing on is a student mindset. Um, and, and so like in terms of your, book uh discussion within your within your firm what do you guys do in terms of like picking books and discussing because i i do think that that's a really healthy thing for firms to do so what does that look like for you guys so for us um usually what happens is i'll suggest a book and then or suggest some options and they'll pick or vote on it and so that's what we've done and then I've, i've incentivized kind of reading them and applying them to your life, not only your firm life, but your personal life. Yeah, that's because awesome. we want to holistically represent people and holistically help our ourselves and our staff. And so that's what we've been doing. And so in terms of a student mindset, it's funny you said that because one of the last books we read talked about um, falling in love with the basics. And if you can fall in love with the basics and be really, really good at those things, the, the hard stuff becomes so much easier. And so um, now I'm studying the basics of law and evidence and criminal procedure and DWI stuff religiously, even though there a lot of the stuff I already know, like the back of my hand, I'm just like really like religiously honing down on those things and just attempting to not get sick of the basics. Yeah. No, I mean, I I think it's, it's funny because so often, like when you're, uh, when you're going through, you know, sports in middle school, high school, you know, uh, even into even into college, like they're focusing on the basics, the fundamentals, right? Like they're always talking about fundamentals in sports, and there's a reason for that, right? Like these building blocks that you know you have to like routinely practice in order for them to become a part of your nature is so critical. Like I mean, just 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 being you know kind of having that ingrained in you is so important. So that's I love that. Well, in terms of how do you, how do you oh, pick ahead. the books for your firm? We, you know, we've kind of gotten a little bit away from that. We used to have, I would say, more of a healthy like book club mentality when we were a little bit smaller. 
And then we've, I say, gotten away from that as a group. Now we, um, we have basically the option for anybody to uh, order through uh, Stephanie, our kind of office manager, a book. Um, you know, if they if they're interested in in you know reading something, and we've got suggestions on that front. But I would like to get back to the you know kind of firm wide, and that's part of the reason I was asking about that. We used to read um, and to do a book discussion regularly as a group. Now we kind of have like our team huddles once a week where we get together, but we don't really have like a a kind of topical focus. And I do think that um, that would be better. It's it's probably been at least at least a year since we had like a we we were doing a quarterly book. Um, as a group. And that was really healthy. I think it's just, you know, constantly like being on that learning side of things. And so, you know, at first we were picking, you know, I was, I, again, I kind of in your line, I was kind of picking or suggesting books to the team that were mostly business oriented, but then we moved to like some, um, you know, uh, other, other kind of like biographies that also had some like life lessons. So we, you know, we've done, um, it, uh, I think one of the last books that we did was Will Smith's Will, the, the his autobiography, which was awesome. Had a, gr- a bunch of great life lessons in it. Matthew McConaughey's uh, Green Lights. Um, we did Cy Wakeman. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the name of her book is. No Ego, which is a great, great uh, book about kind of like being a part of a team. So you know, it's it's mostly been about business and professional development but i just think that having something to discuss as a group is so healthy like learning together there's just something about like the learning together and trying to pick things that you can implement like you said into your personal life is so healthy so it's a good good call to action on your end for us to on our side of things get back to the basics well, let me know what you all are reading maybe we'll read it together if yeah we, if it's not yeah yeah that would be good. I, I and I think that some one of the things that I'm kind of interested in building is more of like a cross training model, you know. So, you know, we're doing like our uh mock trial coming up in a couple of weeks where we're um, you know, inviting outside firms to that as kind of like a way to do joint training. But I also think doing other joint train like I, I would just call them like joint training exercises, right? Like, you know, the the uh Preseason in the NFL, you know, there, there's teams that will practice together and scrimmage against one another because there's kind of like that opportunity to to learn. And so, yeah, I think doing like a joint book club, doing um, some sort of you know joint training, whether it's like, hey, let's get our two intake teams to come together and kind of bounce ideas off of one another about how to do intake better. That's I think where a lot of the best learning experiences can happen because. Um, even as we bounce ideas off of one another as law firm owners, the real uh, the real work from the firm comes from the admin team. Like, I mean, I just that's that's where the real uh, magic happens. And so, you know, if, if if we can get some some better joint training exercises on that front, I think it really serve serve us. And so, I encourage other other lawyers listening to do the same thing in their local jurisdictions or do it virtually, however you can make it happen. Cause I think there's not enough, there's not enough sharing among teams. There's very limited sharing among lawyers, but there's not enough sharing among teams. Um, well, I kind of to shift gears a little bit here, Ryan, in terms of the kind of, uh, criminal defense lawyer of the now, what are you know some of the biggest challenges that you think face solo or small uh, firm criminal defense lawyers here in 2024? What are some of the the biggest kind of challenges on the horizon? I think probably one of the biggest challenges that comes to mind is the expansion of public defenders office across offices across the state. Um, that can be a big challenge. Um, uh, we've talked about it here at our office, and I, I look at it as an opportunity, and I'm, I'm looking forward to we, uh, getting a public defender's office here. Um, 
I don't see it as something that will negatively impact our caseload or our profits or the people we serve or anything of that nature, but I can see how it would be pretty problematic for some firms um, who rely on quarter point at work. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that that is definitely something that is coming down the pike. I know out in the Western district here, just, just West of Buncombe County, all of those counties are, are getting ready to, um, get a public defender's office. A few of the Eastern counties that we have lawyers in just have gotten public defender's offices. And so, again, I think there's a real need. I mean, they're, I, I, part of the reason that they needed that out in the West is because there are so few lawyers on the court appointed list. And, uh, you know, so it, it was a, it was really a, a kind of necessity. There's not enough lawyers kind of moving into the smaller, smaller markets, which I think is such a valuable thing to do. I think it's really a, you know, if, if, if you're interested in going into the world of criminal defense, going into your hometown or like where you grew up or a smaller market is so amazing because you just get to do things that you would not get to do in a larger market. Like there's just more, there's in a lot of ways, more opportunity to, to try cases, to, um, push things. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a, you know, there's just more leeway sometimes. So, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that that's going to be, be a challenge, you know, in terms of along almost the same lines. And you kind of just said, you looked at that as an opportunity. Are there other opportunities that you think kind of, uh, exist currently that, um, you know, are, are are really kind of like on the on the forefront and like people need to somewhat capitalize on here immediately before it becomes more commonplace. Um so I actually think the use of uh AI yeah man is something that lawyers should absolutely be using within reason, within ethics, within common sense. Um, and in some ways, it could be argued that we have a responsibility to use it. Yes, I totally agree. Um, because if we are using AR, if we or even just say technology, if we're using technology to its greatest extent, we would be spending less time on cases. And if we're spending less time on cases, we potentially could charge people less. And that is important for public good if we're really being as efficient as possible. Yes. Because, I mean... A client could call me today and I could say, yeah, I can research your issue and I could go drive down to UNC Law School and use a bunch of books or I could go to Westlaw. And yeah. if I went to Westlaw, I could certainly charge them way less than I would have to charge them to drive to UNC Chapel Hill School of Law Library. Yeah. It's the same thing. We should be using technology to better ourselves, better our clients and best address their needs. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. I mean, the the AI is getting better at such a rapid rate. I mean, it's getting better at such a monumental rate that I I think that it really is going to be, you know, wh whatever, whatever kinks you want to say exist now with, you know, so much money again, going in the legal industry in terms of Westlaw and LexisNexis pouring money into, you know, streamlining AI research, it's just going to improve massively as things kind of get, get better and better. I was uh, recently, doing my, my, uh, my daughter is taking a, uh, through a dual enrollment course, a, uh, history class from our uh, local, uh, tech college here in, in Buncombe County. And, uh, she, you know, was writing this, writing this history paper. So, um, you know, she, she put a ton of work into it. I reviewed it, made, you know, made some suggested changes in terms of like, Hey, you know, this it might sound better this way. Um, and then, you know, afterwards, I was like, I'm going to go on AI and like type in the prompt and see what comes up. And man, it was incredible. Like the, you know, the, the, I mean, the paper, like to the T, it was like, I, I was like, you know, write a two page paper, hit these highlighted things. And like, it just gave the, I was like, that was so much better than like what I was, <laughs> what I was, you know, doing. And so, I mean, it's just a real, I think part of it is just, learning like instead of just like saying oh it doesn't work it's broken i think it's about like you kind of said toying with it having fun with it go go in and and instead of like using it to write a legal memo for your case ask it to write an email ask it to like change the tone of an email that you've already 
written because it's wild what the the AI stuff can do. I know Brian King was mentioning um, uh, recently on on uh, he he was doing a recorded call on LinkedIn with Jesse Fry, and he was saying that all of his uh, attorneys at their office have to put their emails through AI and ask you know what the tone of the the email says or or asked to kind of make make sure that the tone is polite whatever it might be even for inner office email so it kind of like wow. you know so you're not sending sending something that doesn't kind of sound nice to a coworker or whatnot and it's just like man that's pretty wild cuz it's easy you know it's really easy yeah, to do it but is. it's about playing with it you know, I was on Facebook today. I was going to writing a status and now you can write your Facebook statuses with AI. I didn't know that. Yeah. That, I mean, think about, yeah. I mean, it's just wild how, how, you know, amazing there there is like opportunity there all over the place. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're trying to kind of increase social media posting, you know, use it to help kind of write content for your website that, yeah, just the vast improvements. And I think part of it is just, again, in, instead of just either trusting it implicitly and then getting, you know, roasted because you gave something that was bad or, or put something on the web that didn't make any sense. Um, or on the flip side, just like, that's dark magic. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go near it. It's about just playing around with it. And, you know, a lot of folks in our profession are very concerned with it. And, my thoughts are AI was not going to replace lawyers, certainly not criminal defense. No. Lawyers. Yeah, for sure. But it's not lawyers who use AI will absolutely replace lawyers who don't. Yeah. That I do agree with. Yeah, I do as well. I mean, I think, I think in addition to basically what you said, you know, it's going to, if you can decrease the time you spend on a case, you can decrease your fee. You can also, if you're decreasing the time you're spending, you know, sending emails or, uh, you know, writing, writing up, uh, whatever it is that you have to do for the firm, uh, content creation for the website or whatever it might be. You can now spend more time with clients. You can have more of a personal interaction with your clients as opposed to like, I need to get all these other things done. So, I mean, there's, yeah, multiple, multiple uses for it. So I, yeah, I totally think that that's going to like change the game for us on the law as a whole, but criminal defense, I think we have ability to maximize it because unlike big law firms that really probably have to take some time to pivot for most of us, criminal defense lawyers, we are, we're at a level that it's, it's relatively easy to be like, Hey, this is, we're going to adopt this new change and this is how we're going to do things now. So it really can make a difference on that front. Well, well, Ryan, as we kind of come to come to a close here, um, tell me, you know, I think that one of the the valuable things that we have um, in terms of of camaraderie, uh, collegiality, is kind of like our local bars. And I would say that of the local bars that I've kind of like been a part of, I think we got a great local bar here in Buncombe County. But Rowan seems to have like a amazing local bar. Like, I mean, it seems like it's kind of like, uh, some sort of like criminal defense think tank. I don't know what you guys are doing down there, but the, the, the water is different in terms of the criminal defense bar. So tell me, you know, uh, passing along maybe some of the juice of that, how, how do we improve our local criminal defense bars? Great question. So it's funny because when you were saying about how great the local bars you you that you are in are, I was thinking they might not have Rowan beat because we are different here. <laughs> you guys um, are. It's, it's funny you mentioned that. But I mean, for for example, we go to lunch every month, at least once a month. We go to yeah. lunch, um, same time, same place. We all know when it's going to be and where. And we talk about the issues that are going on. And sometimes we talk about nothing. We just eat and break bread. Do, do um, you know how long that's been going on for, Ryan? It's been going on for over seven years. That's awesome. I can tell you that. Yeah, um, that's at one awesome. point, it did used to be that anyone from the entire bar could go to it, but um, other folks just stopped going. So it just became solely criminal defense. And so that's been going on for about five and a half, six years where it's just us. Um, and then every now and then a judge will come if we invite them or they want to come and share something with us or um, something that has frustrated them that we are doing or we can do better, things of that nature. But um, the other thing is, I don't believe that we compete with each other. Yeah. Um, anyone will help any other lawyer out at any time. If someone says, Hey, I have this case, 
and you need help, they'll tell you what to do or what they've done in the past. They'll share your case law if they know it. They'll help you any way I can if they can. I mean, I've, a lot of times, you know, you, you see someone who's uh, arguing something that's incorrect or something that could be argued better, and you'll see someone come up to them and, you know, whisper in their ear. Uh, certainly if it's something that it's plainly obvious and that they're just missing or having a brain fart moment at that time. Um, but our bar is super friendly and, and kind local. Um, I, I've been a part of a lot of bars as well, and this is by far my favorite one. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, the caliber of of lawyers down there is just pretty wild. And I mean, I, I think that that, you know, kind of regular social time is so critical, um, you know, in terms of our, our local bar. As of late, we've kind of had like quarterly meetings and, um, you know, it was, you know, I, I'm kind of like, uh, it, it, we don't really have like a formal structure, but I kind of like am in charge of like getting the meetings run. And, you know, there was times when it's like, there's nothing on the agenda. And, you know, if, if you're doing it in a meeting space, in a meeting sense, it's kind of like, well, what's the purpose of coming if there is nothing to talk about? So, you know, we really didn't have anything on the agenda for quarter number four, and we just ended up doing this Christmas party. And it was like by far the most heavily attended uh, meeting of the year. And I think a lot of that was just because it was like people just wanted to get together and talk. Like we didn't want to get together and like kind of discuss things that, you know, may not lead to any change or just listen to somebody droning on for, for some period of time. So I think that that kind of like informal lunch social setting is so powerful in terms of really bringing change. But I, I think, you know, to improve the practice of criminal defense across the state, you have to have like a great local bar. Um, so again, yeah, I, I, Rowan's, Rowan's doing it right. And, and we have a CLE every year as well. Yeah, you um, guys rock it. And we also have a family law CLE as well. But um, the criminal one is bar none. I have always enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I, I just went to the one um, that was was sponsored by by y'all. In uh, they they obviously did it locally, but then they also did it again sure. over in um, Silva, and it was killer. I mean, just you know, just great, great speakers, great content. I mean, just really well put together. And I mean, again, the test, I think that student mindset, you know, if you have that plus the social side, that really is what makes a great bar. Cause then you can go to bat for, again, not just your colleagues, but your friends along with that kind of like educational spark. So man, I, I love it. And, um, yeah, I, I would just encourage anybody that is trying to kind of bring that level of representation to their local bars to try to follow what you guys are doing and have a, a more regular social interaction time. I really enjoy it. I really do. Well, Ryan, I, I, I so greatly appreciate you coming on the on the podcast. I will continue to uh, to be again, you know, using your terminology, fangirling on the social media end of things because I love reading the content. It's just a blast, man. Like you, you put out stuff that is meaningful. You put out stuff that, you know, again, some of it may be directed at clients, but I I feel like a lot of it is directed at lawyers as well. And so it's just like you you say what I'm thinking on there, and it's it's uh it's refreshing. Like you know, good days and bad days that are shared on there. It's 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 cool. So. Hey, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that compliment. It means a lot coming from you. Well, sweet man. Well, I will definitely we'll we'll continue the conversation. We'll have to uh we'll have to get back together here soon. I'd love to.